Tonight, military will resist violent secessionist agitations in the country. Val's chief of defense staff says no one or group will be allowed to challenge the Nigerian state with force. Southern Kaduna People's Union urges federal governments to declare armed herdsmen as terrorist group as it deplores continued killing. And major websites go offline in a widespread global outage of service. Plus business, sports, news from Abuja and later international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Central Bank of Nigeria to launch its digital currency in October. On sports news tonight, Everton's Richarlison scores a hat-trick as General Loki Rabo is talking tough concerning recent security developments across the country and he says the Nigerian military and other security agencies will resist any attempt by anyone or group of persons wanting to use the instrument of violence against the Nigerian state under the guise of agitation or secession. General Irabo made this comment today when he met with senior or retired senior military officers from the Southeast Geopolitical Zone in Oweri, the Imo State capital. According to him, Security agencies are not against any agitation, but it is necessary to go through the instrumentality of the Constitution because the Constitution provides an avenue for anyone to ventilate their anger. The Chief of Defense Staff, General Lucky Irabo, arrives the venue of the stakeholders' meeting with retired senior military officers from the Southeast Zone in Uwere, the Imo State Capital. And straight away, he inspects the ceremonial quarter guard mounted in his honor. Thereafter, he moves into the hall where the retired and serving senior officers are waiting to commence this important event. Considering the, IT the general officer commanding 82 Division, Major General Taurid Lagbaja, sets the tone for the gathering. This important forum will help in shaping and enhancing our collective response to emerging security challenges in the Southeast region. It is hoped that the synergy of ideas that will be generated in the course of this interaction will contribute significantly towards a better understanding of the security challenges confronting the region with a view to providing solutions to them. For the Chief of Defense Staff, the wealth of experience of the retired senior military officers is very much needed at this crucial time. Yes, the armed forces, just as was earlier pointed out, are the forefront of addressing these security threats. But we also believe that the feedback coming from you will be very critical in redressing these security threats. He also has a word on the persistent agitations and the threat they pose for the country, as well as Thursday's killings in Enugu State. Security setting to the generality of the people, of, of the populace, and of course the environment that is devoid of um, tension. It is because of the work on the ground that security agencies are undertaking. So what happened, of course, in Enugu is only a pointer that well, it's not yet a uh, huru. And so that's the reason that even more makes this interaction to be very compelling. And I believe that going forward, we will see an incremental improvement in the security disposition, not just in the southeast, but of course across the country. Former Chief of Army Staff Azubike Hejerika commends the military for coming up with the initiative, saying it will go a long way in restoring peace in the zone. The gathering today is unique in the sense that it is bringing the veterans and those currently serving together towards finding lasting solution to the spate of insecurity all over the country. With this kind of meeting already held in the Northwest Zone, it is believed that the over gathering, which is seen as timely, will go a long way in dousing the tension in the region and, by extension, the nation.
Bandits and terrorists killing innocent citizens across the country may be in for a showdown as the Nigerian Air Force has taken delivery of the first batch of the A-29 Super Tucano aircraft in Kano State. The aircraft were received by the Minister of Defense, Major General Bashir Magashi, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Farouk Yaya, and Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Oladayo Amo. The aircraft are part of the 12 fighter jets sold to Nigeria by the U.S. to aid combat actions and air assaults in the northeast and other parts of the country. Last year, the Air Force stated that air fighters from Nigeria were already in the U.S. receiving additional training on the usage and applications of the fighter jets when they are eventually added to the fleet of combat aircraft. Police authorities in Zamfar State say they have succeeded in neutralizing one of the armed bandits who blocked Kosol Sokoto Road at Dogon Karfe after kidnapping 12 commuters. The armed bandits blocked Kosol Sokoto Road yesterday, scaring commuters who scampered to safety. Police tactical operatives on patrol along the road quickly mobilized to the location where they engaged the kidnappers in a gun duel, forcing some of them to flee into the forest. During the encounter, one of the bandits was killed while 11 kidnapped victims were rescued. Meanwhile, the police in Nasarawa state say they are on the trail of bandits who invaded Gidansule village of Kiana local government area, killing five persons. This is contained in a statement by the command explaining that the gunmen shot sporadically in the air before attacking the compound where the victims reside. Well, the security situation in southern Kaduna remains a sore point for residents and they are calling on the federal government to declare those responsible for the killings as terrorist groups well, 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 and at the same time declare a state of emergency in the state. The president of the southern Kaduna People's Union, Mr. Jonathan Asake, made the call at a news conference in Abuja criticizing the government for not responding adequately to threats posed by bandits who continue to wreak havoc in the region. According to the union, no fewer than 100 people have been killed in Zango Kataf local government alone, with over 12 villages raised. We find it strange to explain how government is unwilling to tackle banditry and kidnappings in the north, with particular reference to uh, the recent attacks on communities in Zangon Kataf, local government area, where no fewer than a hundred persons have been massacred within seven days, 12 villages completely decimated. Even when these bandits brought down an Air Force jet last Sunday, July 19th, at the border between Zamfara and Kaduna State, thereby challenging the sovereignty of our country, the government has not shown enough action to tackle the dangers posed by these banditry and insurgency. We are convinced beyond reasonable doubt that the government has a capacity to combat these dreadful, these daredevil bandits that have made life unbearable for our communities. We call on the federal government to immediately declare these armed Fulani herdsmen, kidnappers, bandits, or by whatever name they call, they go, to declare them as a terrorist organization. Away from security matters, the president has met with some state governors and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, who paid him homage at his country home in Dora, Katsina State. During the meeting, President Muhammad Buhari reminded Nigerians to reflect on the past before the coming of the APC-led administration, where insecurity in the Northeast and the South-South was at its peak. He observed that it's only people in the Northeast that will tell Nigerians the story of how about half of their local government areas were occupied by the terrorists. The subsequent development in the Northwest is the most amazing one because uh, uh, Nigeria was there are the same people, same religion. And they keep on killing each other, stealing each other's cattle and other things, and burning their own bridges. Now, 
in preparation to reach the right act, I have to make changes in security, remove all service heads and the inspector general police, put new ones, give them time to make the appointments, to reorganize and go around, and let's get down to our fundamental responsibility, securing the nation. Well, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, is asking Nigerians to expect major changes in the constitutional amendment. He made the comment at a media chat in Dora, Katsina State, after the visit to the President. Well, well let's, uh, let's hold our horses and wait uh, till the outcome of the... Uh, but you'll see some changes, major changes. It's going to be a constitutional amendment uh, like never before. Uh, I've kept saying we're not going to just be tinkering around the edges. We're just going to make fundamental changes that will be good for the, for the north, the south, the west, the east, and the whole of Nigeria. All Nigerians will be able to identify with this particular electoral amendment. We came on the mantra of security, anti-corruption, and economy. And if you want to be objective, we are not where we were. The security is still very, 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 very terrible. But a lot of the Boko Haram is decimated. The leaders have been killed. Uh, those who foment trouble uh, have, been, have been arrested. So I think we're, we're on course. We're on course. It's, a di it's difficult, don't get me wrong. The, uh, we, met, we met some difficulties on ground and we're working and building slowly, slowly but surely. Uh, that's what we're doing. Into politics, the Ogun State Governor Dakwa Biodo is asking members of the All Progressives Congress to troop out and vote to ensure a resounding victory for the party and its candidate in Saturday's local government election in the 22 or 20 local government and electoral wards of the state. He made the call in Abeokuta, the state capital, while rounding off his campaign tour of local government, where he canvassed for votes for the party's candidates in the forthcoming local government election. It was indeed a carnival-like gathering of party members, faithful and supporters, as Governor Dakwa Biodo rounds off his campaign tour. The venue of the event comes alive just as the governor and his entourage are well seated to show support to the candidates for Abelkuta North. Party members took their turns to comment what they described as a purposeful leadership of the governor, which has translated to development across the state. Of course, there is a governor that has passed through Abekuta North that hasn't done something for the state. I spoke with the state governor that we have an interest in who becomes the newly elected chairman of Abekuta North local government. But the governor in his wisdom rather advised on a preferred candidate which shows that he is not just a progressive leader for Abekuta North but for the people of Ogu State. Today we have a governor that I'm very proud of to go on radio and television and defend with all of my might, my strength and my spirit. What I will tell you is that they thought 2019 was tough. We are having an easy journey ride in 2023. The governor, while appreciating party faithful and supporters for their steadfastness, demanded more unity of purpose to ensure victory for the party. This is the 20th local government in eight days. There has been no violence in Ogun State. Nobody has as much as stepped on somebody else's toe. This did not happen in the past. Ogun State in the past was defined by courtesy, violence. I mean, it was so bad in Ogun State. But today, Ogun State is judged as, if not, one of the most peaceful states in this country. It's not by accident, though. It's intentional. Because we in Ogun State, we are very peaceful people. We will not be defined by violence. The high point of the event was the absorption of defectors from other political parties into the fold, signaling manoeuvring and realignment in preparation for the 2023 general elections. In part two, after the break, more states continue to record cases of cholera, the latest being Yobe, with three people dead and two others hospitalized. Stay with us. 
If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Military will resist violent secessionist agitations in the country, vows Chief of Defense Staff. Says no one or group will be allowed to challenge tonight given hours restriction of movement across the state ahead of Saturday's local government elections. The polls will hold on Saturday, July the 24th in all the 20 local government areas of the state and 37 local council development areas for chairmanship and councillorship seats. The State Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Binga Motosho, said in a statement that the restriction will enable the Lagos State Independent Electoral Commission conduct hitch-free elections. The statement also urged all eligible voters to participate in the elections, which it says requires the cooperation of all residents. And now to health matters, Yobe State in the Northeast is the latest state in the country to record new cases of the cholera outbreak and deaths from the disease. Three persons have died and two others hospitalized following the outbreak of the disease at Gergir community in Jakusko local council of the state. Jigawa has recorded 2,000 cases with 20 deaths, Enugu with 14 new cases and 19 deaths, while the nation's capital Abuja has recorded 54 deaths with 604 cases. Balche state has also recorded over 800 cases and 28 deaths. So the question is, to what extent is government on top of this cholera outbreak? And we are joined on the news at 10 by Dr. Godwin Tadam, the chief consultant epidemiologist of the Federal Ministry of Health. He joins us via Zoom from Abuja. Thank you for joining us on the news at 10, doctor. I, I know COVID-19 seems to be taking a chunk of the attention, but with over 10,000 cases nationwide and hundreds of fatalities from cholera, and that's between January and June this year, this is definitely huge. Did this maybe creep up on us? Well, it has usually been, like, uh, usually expected. It has been a kind of an annual event in the country. But uh, I must tell you, the, the country is also trying so much to ensure that this situation does not continue. As we all know, uh, cholera is... Uh, uh, it, a, a disease that is transmitted like uh, from waste, phys, fecal oral in nature. That is, uh, it's it usually come as a result of poor sanitation and uh, uh, where you have shortage of water supplies and food. so it comes uh, in a situation where you begin to have shortage of water supplies and uh, other factors. So, like you can see. It has not been as bad as it used to be, but again, it calls for serious concern because so many, so few people are still dying as a result of the disease. You know, there will always be comparisons, I mean, whether we like it or not, between the response to COVID-19 and the response yeah. to cholera, which is clearly affecting those in rural areas much more. So what exactly is being done to curb this? Yeah, one thing is... Uh, a single cholera case cause for attention because it spreads very widely and uh, or very fast also. And because the transmission of cholera is more salient in nature in that uh, in the community, once it is there, other people get in contact and it begins to spread. The way uh, COVID came, you know, is quite different and because we are gradually getting used to cholera being part of us and it is actually bringing that like a desical among people because to prevent cholera the work lies more with the population than with government like i've said earlier community effort hygiene individual effort all these matters when it comes to uh, it matter when it comes to cholera so essentially now, what, what do people need to know about preventing this disease? You've referenced shortage of water as one of the major causes. And I mean, we've seen pictures of the kind of water people have to use uh, for you know, their daily upkeep. So what do people need to know about preventing this disease? Practically, uh, cholera is, uh, is, uh, is related to hygiene, water supply, and the way we actually manage our food. 
we need to prevent flies and many other fumes taking on food. And like I said, primarily the issue is hygiene. How do people live? Where is the source of their water supply? And in an environment where a case of cholera has been detected, it calls for attention. Every other individual in that environment has to protect himself or herself from the disease. Like if you go to some area, packaged water does not follow the usual expected hygiene uh, procedures. And uh, even uh, the, the, the bacteria causing uh, cholera can stay up to two weeks. So if you, uh, somebody who has cholera, passes, uh, let's see, uh, some things, uh, I don't want to mention something on the screen, but again, it can remain in, in, in thicker products for up to two weeks in water, in swimming pool and other things. So what we need to do practically is hygiene. And I must tell you that the government is equally doing some things, like uh, in area where there's cholera and there's water supply to the communities, the water resources, the Federal Ministry of Water Resources, State Ministry of Water Resources, they know what to do by ensuring that uh, the water that is passed to the community provided safe, like chlorination of water is usually a major thing that is done during uh, water, uh, water supply and where cholera has been reported. And for individuals, we need to mind where we get our water source Things that can easily uh, keep uh, the bacteria, like ice cream, even in swimming pool, where people swim in, in, in. An individual with cholera will get in and infect other, people's, other people. So these are some of the things. But primarily, we need to improve our sanitation, hygiene, and also where we live, mm. crowd. All this call for shortage of uh, water. And again, uh, we need to report individuals who is uh, manifesting with symptoms of cholera, which mm. is stooling, uh, uh, watery stooling, like uh, uh, we would describe it. And they need to report in the hospital. And such individuals should be isolated from contacting, having contact with other individuals in the environment. And uh, we have at the local government level DSN uh, officer who can get this information and transmit it. All states have state epidemiologists who should be or who usually be at the top of the situation once it's reported. One of the challenges we normally have is this goes on in the community without anybody reporting it. Because if it is reported, the role of the state epidemiology is to quickly trace the uh, individual that is spreading the disease. And once that individual is isolated, the disease will be controlled. Or when the source of the infection is located, the disease will be controlled. But a situation where we don't do all this, we don't report cases until it gets out of hand, it will continue to be a challenge in our population. Well, Dr. Ntalab, let's round off this conversation in a few seconds by giving us an insight into treatment options and the prospects for recovery. At least uh, give some hope. Yes. In, in, in cholera, the major cause of death is uh, uh, loss of fluid, uh, dehydration. So in individuals who have cholera, what you need to do is to begin to, you know, replace the fluid that is being lost. There's oral rehydration, and uh, in most chemists and uh, pharmacies, you can get oral rehydration therapies that have been so then you use it according to prescription. As the individual is passing this to you are replacing the fluid that is being lost. Right. And if we, continue, if we do this, it is not likely that the individual is going to die. Well, Dr. Godwin Tadam, the Chief uh, Consultant Epidemiologist, the Federal Ministry of Health, thank you so much for your time on the News at 10. Thank you, it's always my pleasure. Well, let's head over to the court where the Nigerian police force has arraigned one Chinyere Igwegbe before a federal capital territory high court on a four-count charge bordering on allegations of 
criminal conspiracy, defamation of character, intimidation, and threat to life of former governor of Imo State, Ikedio Hakim. But she has pleaded not guilty to the charges. While moving the bail application, her counsel told the court that the police had no right to take over the case since the office of the Attorney General had taken over the same matter. The prosecution did not oppose the bail application but prayed the court to attach stringent conditions to ensure her presence in court. In his ruling, Justice Yusuf Halisu ordered the defendants to produce two charities who must be resident in Abuja and must have a regular income. The charities must also produce the defendant in court for her trial until it is dispensed of. She is also to deposit her international passport with the court and can only travel out of the country with the permission of the court. And the case involving Yoruba Nation agitator Sunday Adeyemo, also known as Sunday Bo, has been adjourned till tomorrow, Friday, July the 23rd, by a court in Cotonou, Benin Republic. There are reports that this separatist activist is believed to have been arraigned on immigration-related offences. Igbo and his wife have been in custody since their arrest at Cardinal Bernardin International Airport, Cotonou, as they attempted to board a flight to Germany on Monday. They were reportedly interrogated by security operatives there at the Brigade Criminal Facility uh, between uh, Wednesday and today. His wife, who is said to be a German citizen, has been released. Many of his supporters arrived at the court premises in their numbers in anticipation of his arraignment which did not take place until later in the day. The Yoruba Nation leader uh, was arrested alongside his wife at the Cotonou Airport on the night of July the 20th, reportedly by Interpol, while on the way to catch a fight to Germany. It was gathered that the Nigerian government is working to have him extradited, but Benin Republic is said to have insisted on following due process and is opposed to any action that is against the law regarding Igbo's extradition. Igbo had been leading agitations for the Yoruba nation and the Department of State Services declared him wanted after security operatives raided his home in Ibadan earlier this month. When the news at 10 returns, Central Bank to launch its own digital currency in October. Well, that's some business news. Join us again. We now cross over to our Abuja studio for more on the news at 10 with Linda Akibe. Good evening, Linda. Good evening, Coyote. The federal government has asked the newly inaugurated governing board of Nigeria's Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, NATI, to ensure global best practices in contract ownership, disclosure of beneficial ownership, and data mainstreaming in the country's extractive industry. Speaking at the inauguration of the 15-man board in Abuja, passionate. the secretary to the government About of the, the federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, underscores the need for board members to guide NATI in the implementation process of the policies and recommendations of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. The SGF notes that the extractive industry is very strategic to the government's economic sustainability agenda and urges the board to key into it. Your mandate as the board of this organization is to ensure effective IT implementation in Nigeria by providing policy and strategic direction, guidance, monitoring, and oversight of IT process in Nigeria. Let me remind you that unlike most agencies of government, NAITI is not only just a local agency of government, but part of an international organization Hence, it must be seen to comply with the principles of international IT. The extractive industry is very strategic to Nigeria's economy and hence central to the administration's economic agenda. Let me also, on behalf of Mr. President, use this opportunity to renew the commitment of the Nigerian government to IT implementation under the provisions of NAITI Act 2007. And international standards and best practices under the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative principles 
and emerging issues such as beneficial ownership disclosure, contract transparency, data mainstreaming, among others. The Nigeria Union of Journalists is insisting that while it is not against media regulation, it must not be done by non-professionals or politicians. This reaction is coming from the leadership of the Nigerian Union of Journalists in the wake of the outcry against seeming attempts by government to gag the media. A correspondent, Terry Kumi, takes a look at the issue of the threat to press freedom in Nigeria. Freedom of the press is the principle that communication and expression through various media must be done freely and without censorship by the government. It is critical to a democracy in which the government is accountable to the people, as the media functions as a watchdog to the government's wrongdoing. The Nigerian media has battled to stay out of the control of the government for much of its history, despite the protection granted by Section 39, Subsection 1 of the Constitution, which states that every person shall be entitled to freedom of expression, including freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart ideas and information without interference. And quite recently, the Speaker of the House of Representatives was of the opinion that there were limits to this portion of the Constitution. Freedom of expression is not absolute. And that is made abundantly clear even in the Constitution itself. If you go to Section 45 of your Constitution, it tells you how your freedom, which somebody said was guaranteed, is constitutionally is allowed. However, the government can limit that freedom. And this is for the sake of health, morality, security. It's written in black and white, not me. To further push for stringent measures to regulate the media, two bills were presented before the House of Representatives, the NBC Act Amendment Bill and the Press Council Amendment Bill. Both have been vehemently opposed by media professionals and civil society organizations. The Commission can give directives probably to the licenses, but only the Minister has the power to give directives of a general nature to the Commission which must be obeyed by the Commission. Section 21B should provide for the Commission the power to approve licenses without reference to other government organs, while Section 21C should be removed. 21B is the one that says the NBC should just be a post office, just to collect uh, applications and not do anything. 2C, 21C is the one that says uh, the Minister and the, uh, Mr. President you know, should uh, do the approval. So we are saying that one should be removed. The regulatory body should have the power to issue licenses. We are proposing that uh, uh, the NBC and the National Broadcasting Act should provide for the right of appeal to the board where sanctions applicable for alleged breach of the Nigeria Broadcasting Code could include hefty fines, suspension, or withdrawal of license. Under the current arrangement, uh, the NBC, as often is the case, is the accuser, uh, the prosecutor, and the judge in its own case. I will think that this stands against uh, the principles of democracy. In reaction to alleged attempts to stifle free speech, on Tuesday, July 13, 2021, this is how the print media reacted. The proposed amendment of the NBC and MPC Acts made provisions for journalists to be jailed for up to three years or fined up to 10 million naira for false information without the option of retraction. In the proposed amendment to the NBC Act, the Commission has given powers to determine public interest and impose sanctions on television stations, including fines and revocation of licenses, where it feels broadcasters have acted against its perception of public interest. The Press Council Bill, which has been described by stakeholders as draconian and an overkill, seeks to give the Minister of Information powers to approve the NPC Code. Meanwhile, although no official communication has been read on the floor of the House, the sponsor of the proposed amendment bill announced their suspension. While the presidency has said it has nothing to do with the proposed bills and that it has no intention to stifle free speech, the Nigeria Union of Journalists says it wants regulation to be done appropriately. Like you said, allow the professionals to regulate 
themselves. So we are not just leaving it vague. We are not just leaving it dead. No, we have committees in place that have been set up, and we are already designing something. So when we are asking them to uh, not to go ahead with what they have introduced, it's not like we are keeping quiet. You know what we've done yesterday, and what we've done today, what we're going to still be doing tomorrow and the weeks to come. They already designed, so we are coming up with something. You know. By the end of the day, you are likely going to have something like press conference commission. You are going to have something made up of a team of seasoned professionals, you know, that will be able to pay attend to some of these issues that is raising worries, his concerns in the media and all that. Besides, the, 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 the bulk of the problems we have today in this country are not just more with the media. We have a whole lot of array of issues that we should address. You know, this is just one out of many. So why are we in a haste to, 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 to uh, parcel the media and put it in a pigeonhole? Meanwhile, another worry for the media is the recent directive by the NBC for the media to stop reporting the banditry attacks. The NBC stated that given details of either security issues or victims of these challenges may jeopardize the efforts of security agencies in tackling them. The media is worried that these actions, including attempts to regulate social media, would be injurious to the civic space, freedom of expression, and media freedom in Nigeria. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. The chairman of the Nigerian Diaspora Commission, Mrs. Abike Dabiri Erewa, has announced in an increase in diaspora investments in the nation's health, real estate, and agricultural sectors. And this is just as remittances from the diaspora have dropped by 20% because of the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on world economies. The NIDCOM chairman highlights plans to commence a National Diaspora Merit Award in 2022, which is expected to serve as a boost to making more Nigerians living abroad contribute to the development of a nation's economy. She made the comments ahead of a National Diaspora Day. MultiChoice, the parent company of DSTV, has launched a new business service targeting corporate organizations, pubs, and hotels in Nigeria. The chief customer officer of MultiChoice Nigeria, Martin Mabuto, says this new service is an offshoot of requests from clients and would open windows of opportunities for hotel owners, pubs, and corporate organizations. Entertainment for hoteliers and multinationals is set to get a boost as media giant MultiChoice Nigeria announces packages that will cater to their business needs. You know, we're trying to empower our customers. To the DSTV business them. packages are tailored to suit the needs of hotels, lodges, pubs, clubs, restaurants and corporate businesses. What prompted us to come up with that is obviously the industry is growing and different needs by different sectors. Some of the needs were not met because of the limitations we have on the kind of content that can be shown in those specific areas. For instance, it would not be appropriate for an office place to be showing a movie smack in the middle of the morning that is rated 18. Right now, DSTV caters for residential and non-residential. Anyone that has to do with non-residential sits under the DSTV business portfolio. Now, DSTV business encompasses all organizations, hotels, pubs and clubs, uh, guest houses, bars, restaurants, lounges, and even offices. For multi-choice, customer satisfaction is imperative for growth and economic development. Our responsibility is just to ensure that the customers that come on board these new packages um, are retained, that they stay with us for as long as possible, that they are aware of all the different packages that exist. Customers and end users will also experience a new range of add-on features they've always longed for. What they're offering is basically they're offering the more value, additional channels for the same cost. So basically even the reduced cost as they, they said. The new contents as uh, discussed today caters for everyone, the, the business people, the player, the kids and every, every other person. So I, our experience has been very good with them and with this I believe it will move our relationship forward. Ever since we start opened the hotel we've been running with uh, multi-choice and every other um, company we've tried 
Modi Choice has been the only one that has been able to stand the test of time and give us value for our money. The new DSCV business packages are known as DSCV Stay for Hotels, DSCV Play for Pubs, Lodges, while DSCV Work is aligned for corporate organizations and multinationals with its own personalized customer care line to resolve issues. That's all from Abuja. Now to Anne for business news. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Central Bank of Nigeria, in a webinar today with the fintech community and other stakeholders, announced October date for the launch of the digital currency. The CBN's digital currency pilot scheme tag Project Giant will use the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The Apex Bank explains the benefits of e Naira to include macro management and growth, cross border trade facilitation, financial inclusion monetary policy effectiveness, and targeted social intervention. The UK government says it has proposed a new scheme to boost free and fair trade with Nigeria and other developing countries in the post-Brexit era. A statement by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office says the developing country's trading scheme will replace the UK's generalized scheme of preferences in 2022, the proposed scheme will apply to 67 other countries and it aims to contribute to Nigeria's integration with the global economy, create stronger trade and investment partners for the future, as well as strengthen supply chains. About 53.26 billion Naira, that's the amount lost to flaring of more than 33.04 billion standard cubic feet of natural gas in the first two months of this year. And that's according to the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, the NNPC. And this is coming as latest monthly report from the NNPC shows that oil companies wasted 17.53 billion cubic feet of gas in February, in contrast to 15.51 in February. That report also indicates that 67.15% of the daily gas output was commercialized, while the balance of 32.85% was reinjected, used as upstream fuel or flared fuel. Meanwhile, a new inclusion introduced into the Petroleum Industry Bill by the National Assembly says that oil companies producing less than 10,000 barrels per day in the country will now pay a gas flare penalty of 5 cents per 1,000 cubic feet, while the penalties will be invested to build midstream gas infrastructure in host communities. And let's head to the equities market. It resumed from two-day Muslim holiday with a big bounce at the NSC. All share index rose by more than 1.5%, pushing the market capitalization back and above 20 trillion mark. Ini John Mikwa has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, after two days of rest for the Edo Kabil holiday, the equity market resumed trading with positive vibes and the bull bellowed at the end of today's session. The All Share Index was up 1.67%. Almost 4,000 deals took place as over 203 million units of shares were exchanged by investors. Stock trades by value had two tier one lenders, GTCO and Zenith. Both of them account for over 600 million naira of today's trade. On the sectoral index, a spillover of the positive movement in the two majors of the financial industry lifted the counter as the banking index recorded a 0.31% gain. Oil and gas was also up over 3%. Total and O1O drove this, while industrial goods did extremely well. It was up 4.01%. We trace this to Dangote Cement. Over 362,000 units of its shares of 89.3 million naira were traded. The share price of Dangote Cement added 18 naira to its share price to close at 248 naira. The equity market gained a whopping 330 billion naira at the close of trading. What a good way to resume from the holidays. Let's hope the trend continues. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues 
with Coyote. Well, thank you, Anne. On the foreign scene, the Israeli foreign ministry says the country has been given observer status in the African Union. Foreign minister describes the move as a corrective step to the anomaly that has prevailed for almost two decades. Simon Pusey has more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The official death toll from central China's devastating floods has risen to at least 33 as a year's worth of rain fell in three days in Zhengzhou City. Cleanup efforts are underway in Henan province as footage showed residents evacuated by a digger. Here in the city of Huixian, residents filmed as floodwaters rose in their apartment building. While outside, cars and vans are carried down streets by the rising currents. Emergency task forces have been dispatched across the city to repair the facilities of telecommunications, power supplies and transportation. Authorities say 200,000 people have been displaced by the floods and more than 3 million people have been affected. Meanwhile, China has rejected terms proposed by the World Health Organization to further investigate the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. The country's deputy health minister said it showed disrespect for common sense and arrogance towards science. He said the plan was politicized and that China could not accept it. We are asking actually China to be transparent, open and cooperate. The World Health Organization has been under growing pressure to step up its investigation into the origins of the virus which first emerged in Wuhan and has now killed more than 4.1 million people around the world. A court in Hong Kong has sentenced seven men to jail for their role in the 2019 attacks on pro-democracy protesters. The men got between three and a half and seven years of jail time. In July 2019, more than 100 people in white t-shirts beat protesters, reporters and bystanders at a train station in the northern Yuen Long district. The show director of the Olympics opening ceremony has been dismissed one day before the event is due to be held. Footage of Kentaro Kobayashi from the 1990s recently emerged in which he appears to be making jokes about the Holocaust. Japan's Olympic chief, Saiko Hashimoto, said the video ridiculed painful facts of history. The dismissal is the latest in a string of scandals to hit the Games. At least 70 people have been arrested in the latest round of anti-government protests in Colombia. Colombians took to the streets against the right-wing administration of President Ivan Duque. The protests have morphed into a demand for action to tackle poverty, police violence reported by demonstrators and other issues. Several thousand people were gathered at 23 protest locations in the capital, Bogota. Authorities said 50 people were injured in main cities amid clashes between riot police and protesters. At least 155 people remain missing a week after record rainfall caused devastating floods in western Germany. The president of the country's disaster relief organization said she did not expect rescuers to find any more survivors. The number of fatalities has risen to at least 171 and another 764 people have been injured. The catastrophic flash floods have left thousands of people in western Germany without access to drinking water, electricity and gas. Norway has marked 10 years since the far-right terror attacks killed 77 people in the capital Oslo and the island of Utøya. The ceremony took place in Oslo and was attended by Prime Minister Erna Solberg as well as survivors and relatives of the victims. In 2011, the anti-immigrant extremist Anders Breivik detonated a car bomb outside the Prime Minister's office in Oslo, killing eight, before driving to Utøya Island and shooting 69 people dead at a youth camp. Authorities in Madagascar have said several suspects have been arrested over a plot to assassinate President Andrei Rojolina. The chief prosecutor's office said several citizens and foreigners had been arrested as part of an investigation into the alleged plot. Andrei Rajolina was sworn in 2019 after a hard-fought election and a constitutional court challenge from his rival. And finally, Prince William and his wife Kate have released a new photograph of their son Prince George with a beaming smile to mark his eighth birthday. 
The photograph taken by his mother shows the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's first child perched on a Land Rover. The future king is third in line to the throne behind Prince Charles and Prince William. His birth in 2013 drew worldwide media attention with hordes of reporters and well-wishers gathering outside St Mary's Hospital in London. And that's your international news around the world in five. And now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. World number one Novak Djokovic says he has learned from his previous Olympic heartbreaks and will not allow himself to be distracted from his quest to become the first man to complete the Golden Slam. Germany's Steffi Graf is the only player to have won all four Grand Slams and the Olympic gold in the same year, but the 34-year-old Serbian is three-fifths of his way there. And that's sports news. Thanks, Ayo. And the main news again. The Chief of Defence Staff, General Lucky Rabo, today said the military will resist violent secessionist agitations in the country and that no one or group will be allowed to challenge the Nigerian state with force. And that's the news at 10. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikulu. Good night.